Dismiss our children to Children's Church. Eddie and Lisa. And while they're leaving, let's go to the book of Philippians, third chapter, 12 through 15. If you have that, stand with me, would please? For the reading of God's Word, it'll also be on the screen. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 15. I am reading from and teaching from the New American Standard. If you have a King James or a different translation, the wording will be a little bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. Philippians chapter 3, starting with the 12th verse. The Apostle Paul writing, saying, Nor that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, 
But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything uh, you have a, if any anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts. Let us hear your voice and yours alone. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, "Amen." You may be seated. We're talking about for the last couple of weeks and for the next few weeks, we're continuing to talk about learning from our failures. And if you didn't catch the first three sermons, you can always go back to the Beaver Baptist page or you can go to my YouTube page, uh, which I believe is in the bulletin, um, or it used to be. Uh, nope, it's still in the bulletin, uh, www.youtube.com backslash redemption today. You can go and look at those uh, three sermons. But we're talking about learning from failure. And I told you when we started this that I've made a bunch of mistakes along the way. And a lot of what mine that I've made, I've uh, made in public. I called, I've done a wedding one time and called the woman by the wrong name. Uh, she didn't take too kindly to that. She stopped me and reminded me that her name uh, was, was this name and not the one I called her. And I had to get myself out of that. And many times uh, being in ministry, I've stuck both feet in my mouth, sometimes multiple occasions. We all make mistakes, every one of us. The question is, do we learn from them? Uh, because if we don't learn from our mistakes, we're bound to repeat them. We're bound to do them over again. And, uh, you know, so, so we want to learn from our failures and, and be more. The goal of life as a believer is to be more like Jesus every day. That's our goal, is we're trying to be conformed to His image, to be what He would have us to be. And so we learn from our, our, uh, from our failures. The one I tell the most, I guess, and maybe you get tired of hearing it, but the, I'll tell it again for those who've never heard it, was the, the biggest mistake I believe I ever made was uh, doing a biker wedding. And I mean, these folks looked like they were with Hell's Angels, man. They had chains and they had uh, biker hel uh, uh, bandanas on and they had sunglasses on during the sermon and uh, I'd done this this wedding and after it was over this dude walked up to me and he said uh, preacher thought you done a good job and I said well I appreciate that you'll have to come be in church with us sometime in which he said uh, you know uh, uh, I've drank and I, I don't you know I don't know and I said well, hey listen you know back in the day I've tried alcohol as well you know there's nothing to keep you from coming to church and the guy was with me. He's just rolling. He's just laughing. As the, the guy pulls down his glasses and he looks at me like, yeah, it's real crazy like. And uh, he walks off and the guy that's, that's with me, he's just laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? He said that whole conversation. I said, what? The guy said he would come to church, but he drank. And I told him that I drank some when I was a teenager. Wasn't no great big deal. Don't let that keep you from coming to church. He said, that ain't what he said. That ain't what you said. And I said, okay, what was said? He said, the guy looked at you, said, I would talk to you about it, but I just had a few. To which you looked at him, said, don't think a thing about it, I just had a few myself. <laughs> Bless his heart. The guy's name was Tony Joe. You know what that led to, though? Uh, now, I felt about that tall after it was over, because, you know, I, I, did I really say that? Uh, but after it was all said and done, Tony Joe uh, has departed this world now. But uh, before it was all said and done, Tony Joe ended up coming back to the church, getting saved, giving his life to Jesus before he died and, and uh, went home to, to the Lord. So God can take the bad stuff you do and turn it into good. Okay, so, so just because you've made a mistake, just because you've messed up, just because you've fallen short, maybe you're here today and you, know, you haven't been doing the things of God like you are to be, you haven't been going to church... Like you should, you haven't been praying all those things. You think, well, you know, it's, I'm just too far gone. No, listen, God specializes in comebacks. God specializes in second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Matter of fact, the Bible says that his mercies are renewed daily. Now think about that for just a minute. Sometimes some people offend us and do us wrong. What do we do? We, we say, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm not going to let you take advantage of me. Not ever again. 
I'm not going to come around you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to loan you money. I'm not going to do whatever it is that you've offended me on. But the fact that the creator of the world and all the things that we do to fall, fall him short, he gives us a clean slate every morning. His mercy, he never runs out of having mercy for us. And so our job is to now live a life that, that is trying to honor and please him. And so there's a big word that we talk about in church is holiness. Or another word we talk about is sanctification. There's three-step process in, in the process of being saved. Number one, there's justification. That's when you confess your sins, you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You come to Him. You repent of the things that you've done wrong. All of us, ladies and gentlemen, listen to it. All of us were born into sin because of Adam's fall in, and Adam and Eve's fall in the Garden of Eden. All of us are born estranged from God. We, we're born into sin. It's the passed down product that we now have to deal with. We're all born into sin. And so we all have the same problem. We also all have the same cure. The same cure is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible says that no man comes to the Father except through the Son. So we have the cure for all of us. Jesus is willing to save the rich, the poor, the, the tall, the short, the skinny, the fat, the, the haves and the have-nots. The, the offer is for everybody. I've often told you I've done 17 years uh, in prison. Every Sunday night, once a month, we would go to West Liberty to the state prison, and we would preach and sing. And I have seen some of the, the people that were on, uh, not death row, but inmates that were going to be there for the rest of their lives that would come into that service. And on average, we had about 100 that would show up every, every time that we were there. Uh, there was about 100. And, and so people from all walks of life, from murderers to financial thieves to, to uh, rapists to killers, I mean, whatever, you name it. One of, one of the stories I tell is about a friend that I, we became friends over the years. Uh, his name was Omar. He was a hitman with the mafia. And Omar got saved in prison. He'll spend the rest of his life. I believe he's in Louisville now at, at uh, one of the penitentiaries in Louisville. He'll spend the rest of his days in prison for what he had done as a hitman on the, uh, up in New England area. Uh, last job that he done before he got caught, the, he got caught with a man's heart in a box. He literally, the, the guy owned, owed the mob money, didn't pay him. The mob sent Omar to, to collect. Guy didn't collect. They said, well, if he doesn't collect, bring back proof that you've killed him. Uh, Omar cut out his heart. Brought it back to the mob as proof. Got caught. Mob went down. He went down spending the rest of his life in prison. But it was somewhere along the way that Omar gave his life to Jesus in that facility. Now, Omar, while he's serving the consequences of his sin. See, that's the thing you need to understand. It's just because God forgives us doesn't mean there's not consequences to the things that we, that we mess up on. So, for instance, God will forgive me. For going out here on the road doing a hundred mile an hour. If I'm on my way to town and I'm hungry, man, I got to get to the restaurant before the Christians do. And so I, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to town and I'm driving a hundred mile an hour. Might have to drive 120 just to beat Art to the restaurant because he looks like he's starving to death. You need to feed that boy more often. He just looks miserable there this morning. And so we're trying to. Uh, I'm trying to beat all the Christians to the to the restaurant. And I'm doing a hundred mile an hour. Now, God will forgive me of driving 100 miles an hour, but guess what? I'm not going to avoid the consequences of. If the popo, the police, the sheriff, or whoever it might be, if he's out there along 62 and I'm driving 100 miles an hour into town, guess what he's going to do? He's going to pull me over. And he's going to have repercussions. Now, God will forgive me for driving 100 miles an hour, but the law maybe not so much. And I might have to pay a fine. I might go to jail. I don't know. I might be able to call... And uh, Shannon might be able to get me out of it since he's chief police in Falmouth. Hey, old buddy, this is, you know I was just trying to get to town because you know me, I'm hungry. Get me out of this ticket or at least get me out of jail, something. But now there's going to be consequences for that, right? And so it's the same thing in life with whatever we do. There's always consequences, even though God's willing to forgive us. Sometimes he doesn't expunge us from the, the result of our sin. We have to deal with that sometimes. But there's a good part about that because if I'm going to town doing 100 mile an hour and let's say Shannon's behind me and he does his civic duty as police officer and he pulls me over and he says, boy, you're going to jail because you're not supposed to be driving 100 mile an hour. There's some lessons to be learned from that, right? That if I drive 100 mile an hour and I kill an innocent people, well, you know, that's I've ruined somebody's family's life forever. 
uh, if I have a flat tire, a tire, and tire blows out, and I uh, do it 100 mile an hour, I'm probably going to get hurt, going to tear up some people's property and stuff like that. There's some things that I can learn from the sin that I've done. And it's probably good to suffer those consequences, going to jail, to sit and think about it for a little bit, that, hey, I probably shouldn't have drove 100 mile an hour just to go get a Big Mac. He could have waited 15 more minutes by me driving the speed limit. So just because God forgives us doesn't mean there's not repercussions to our sins. There's going to be things that we're going to have to deal with. But we're trying to become sanctified. We're trying to become more like Jesus. So the first process in the salvation experience is justification. And it's a big word, but break it down this way. God looks at us just as if we never sinned. You probably were taught that in Bible school. Justification, just as if I never sinned. God forgives us. We come to Him. We confess. We place our faith and trust in Him. The Bible says that He cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. He washes us whiter than snow. Then once we start that process, now we're into what's called the sanctification or the holiness process. And the fact is that we're going to be in that process for the rest of your life. If you're saved here this morning, you are currently in the sanctification process. And you will stay there until you take your last breath from uh, this earth. Now, sanctification, if we think about it for just a minute, a little bit, we're thinking about sanctification. What does that exactly mean? It's God's process of cleaning us up. And so if we think about, uh, if we think about washing powders in a washing machine, what does it do? It takes dirty and makes clean. <clears throat> and so... We clean the clothes today. We wear them this week. Guess what we got to do next week? Got to wash the clothes. And some of you ladies know that exactly because you do it over and over and over and over and over. For as long as you live, you'll wash the clothes. Why? Because they get dirty. But guess what? As long as we live, we're going to get dirty. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short. And so holiness or sanctification is God's process of setting us apart. Sanctify means to make holy or to be holy. Holiness refers to separation or apartness. In other words, God is separating us from the world to be to himself, to be who he wants us to be. There should be, now in this day and age, there's a difficulty finding this, that a lot of people who believe in a lot of things that are not biblical will say, well, well I'm a Christian, I just don't believe in the Bible stuff. Now listen carefully. There should be a difference between people that are born again, Bible-believing Christians. There should be a difference between us and the rest of the people in the world. Should be a difference. We don't believe like they believe. We don't think like they think. We don't accept what they accept. We say, well, hold on a minute. Does that make you a bigot? Does that make you a, uh, that you, you don't accept people? You're a phobic. You have one of them phobias? You call it whatever you want it. I call it holiness. That God says, listen, this is my standard. This is what I said is right. This is what I say is wrong. And if you're going to follow me, you should subscribe to what I say is right and what I say is wrong. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom, not the world. Our job as believers is that we're constantly seeking the kingdom's way of doing things. And the kingdom's way of doing things is completely different from what the way the world looks like. Now the world says do whatever you want to do and you're saved. You just do whatever you want. You're born again and you can sin. You can, you can do whatever and it's okay. That's not what the scripture says. There's a right, there's a wrong. There's an order to things. God made a divine order, man and a woman. Uh, God made the, uh, you know, made made stuff for us to remember. Remember to have Sabbath. Keep it, you know, remember Sabbath. Keep it holy. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We're supposed to go to church. We're supposed to read our Bibles, study to show thyself approval, work when it doesn't need to be ashamed. We're supposed to do all these things not to be saved, but because we are saved. I can't do anything other than believe. In the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, I can't do anything other than believe in that in order to be saved. That's the prerequisite. I don't have to work my way into heaven. I don't have to be good enough to get into heaven. Because as a matter of fact, if that was the case, none of us would get into heaven. Because we're all we're all messed up, aren't we? We're all we're all crazy. We're all I mean you know, Becky's looking right at you, shaking her head. <laughs> oh, you're crazy. You're crazy for marrying him? Yeah, there you go. We're all we all got the issues, man. We're all we're all flawed. 
But we can't use the thing, well, we're flawed, so we're just going to do whatever. No, we're flawed, but we're striving to be what God would call us to be. Now, you've got the right in America. Listen, because I want you to understand the difference here. Because the argument is, well, if you don't believe the way I believe, you're this, that, and the other, and you don't, you don't like these folks, you don't like that. No, that's not the case. Listen to me very carefully. In the United States of America, you got the right to believe what you want, live with who you want, sleep with whoever you want, do whatever. You've got the right in America to do that. That's what freedom is. It gives you the right to do that. But in biblical terminology, doesn't make your freedoms as an American doesn't mean that it's right or it's wrong according to the Bible. We as believers belong to a kingdom. We live in the United States of America, but and our allegiance should be as believers first to the kingdom of God. Because that's the vehicle through which we get saved. It's the vehicle through which we have eternal life. It's the vehicle through which we have hope that we're going to close our eyes here, open them up in a place called heaven. It's the vehicle through which you have hope that all of your loved ones who have gone on before you that are believers, we believe that they're in heaven. Well, if, if the if the kingdom can't get them there, guess what? Then we're not going to go either. So we live in the United States, and all those people can do whatever they want to do. You're free to do that. We've got laws on the books about a lot of things. But it doesn't mean as kingdom-seeking people that we should participate in the freedoms that the country affords other people. I don't care what you do. You're free Monday through Friday, on Sunday, Saturday, do whatever you want to do. On Sunday, if you choose to come here, you're going to hear me tell you biblical truth. Now, you might not agree with that, and that's your, that's your, you might walk out there and say, well, that preacher's nuts. He's just old-fashioned, fuddy-duddy. He just believes it the old way, and that's fine. But as long as you come, you're going to hear me tell you what biblical truth is. And biblical truth is opposite of the worldly current standards. Sorry. Just is. And so we can't do certain things and be saved. We can't do certain things and be believers. Because it's counter what God would have us to do. Okay? And so we have to make the decision as people in the process of being clean. I don't have a problem. Anybody wants to do whatever they want to do. It's your thing. I, I'm, I, I would, if you want to put me in a political basket, I guess you could call me very libertarian on that. None of your business, none of my business, what you do in your home. I, that's, that's you. Do your thing, baby. If, that's, if you can live with it, sleep with it, whatever, you, that's on you. But if you come here, you're going to hear me tell you what is right according to the Bible, what is wrong according to the Bible. Now, you should never leave let me make this clear. You should never leave here feeling like I beat you up. Okay? If you leave here feeling like you've been beat up, then I would challenge you to say that that's, that's condemnation. And condemnation is not a God. The Bible says that God didn't come in the world to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. If you leave here convicted, then, hey, maybe I'm to change some things. Conviction is from God. What's the difference? Condemnation is from the devil with his job the purpose of condemnation is to drive you away from God. So condemnation says, well, you know, I'm no good. I don't fit in. I don't belong. I'm not go to church. I'm not pray. I'm not read the Bible. So the next thing you know, you're not doing any of them. You're way over here in the left field. You're so far away from God. You, it's hard to find your way back. Conviction comes from God, and it always says you're better than that. You can do better. You can do this. You can handle this. You can get through this. It will always challenge you to run to God. But again, whatever you want to do is fine with me. You live in America. You can do whatever you want to. But when you come into, uh, when you come in to hear about the kingdom, I'm not going to teach you what the United States says you can do. I'm going to teach you what the kingdom says is right, what the kingdom says is wrong. Here's what I found over 32 uh, years of ministry. I found this to be true. That 100% of the time, the kingdom is always right, and the world is always wrong. Now, somebody should have said amen on that. 100% of the time, the kingdom is always right, and the world is always wrong. I mean, it just works out that way. Now, let me give you an example of that. I've used this example before, but let me use this example again. Pam and I have been married 28 years. Is that right? 27. 27 be 28 next year. 
we dated for, we've been together 32, I think. We dated five years before we got married. See, I'm, I'll never hear the end of this. Uh, you can't remember when we got married. It was uh, August the 12th, 1995. I can't think of my mathematics right off the bat, <laughs> but we started dating in 1990. Now, I will be, I'll be bold, loud and proud and bold to tell you I've never been with any other woman except my wife. Do you know how many sexually transmitted diseases I've had in the 32 years? Uh, well, not 32 years, in the 27 years. Get back that up and make y'all think I was doing something shit in <laughs> My mom been looking at me, ain't she? <laughs> we were virgins when we got married. We did not do, we, we didn't do anything. For 27 years, we've been, we've been married and we've been practicing the thing that, that the Bible talks about. The urge to merge. You don't understand what I'm talking about. Not one time in the 27 years has there been a sexually transmitted disease. Why? Because the Bible is clear. One man, one woman for life. And there is no diseases like that. You don't get that. The people that sleep around multiple partners or they practice an alternative lifestyle. Guess what they always have to worry about? Disease. Now why is that? Because God's design is in confines that if you do it God's way, you don't have to ever worry about getting uh, some sort of sexually transmitted disease. Because God ordained this. What did he tell Adam and Eve when he put them in the garden? He created Adam and said it wasn't good for man to be alone. I don't know why he said that, but he did. And so he, he, he gave us a woman. What did, he tell, what did he tell Adam and Eve? What was their command to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, I've had congregations before that weren't, big, weren't adult enough to handle this, but you understand what that means. Make little babies. Fill the earth. Make other little humans. And guess what? They didn't have to worry about diseases. Why? Because it was in the confines of what God had designed. The world says, well, that's just old, outdated. Love, free love. Love whoever you want. Do whatever you want. It's okay. Well, guess what? There's all kinds of consequences that come into that. Why? Because it's not God's design. You can sleep around with a thousand women, but you're probably going to pick up something along the way. You're probably going to have some problems along the way. You're probably going to have some guilt. The other thing that, that doing it God's way produces is there is no guilt in that. Right? There is no guilt in doing it God's way. Why do you think when we do it the world's way that all this stuff goes on after it gets dark at night? You ever thought about that? Strip clubs don't open until it gets dark at night. Bar, uh, most beer joints and party places don't open until it gets dark at night. Everything's done under the clothes of the clothes of night. Why? So it's, you can't be as recognized when, the, when it's dark as opposed to light shining on you. And so there's always, there's always going to be counterculture, and there's always going to be there. You have to make the determination as a person who's a believer, which way am I going to go? Am I going to go with society, or am I going to go with the kingdom? And I'm going to tell you that 100% of the time, if you go with the kingdom, you will always find satisfactory results. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean it's going to be <clears throat> always going to go your way. Doesn't mean you're going to have tough times. But if we do it God's way, there will always be a blessing to what we do. When we do it the world's way, it's always filled with guilt and condemnation and all that stuff. And so we're in the sanctification process where he's cleaning us. Now the last process that we'll go through is when we die, it's called glorification. We don't get glorified until we get called up into heaven. So we get justified, we get sanctified, and then we get glorified. That's when God, we take our last breath on this planet, God calls us home, he says, welcome in that good and faithful servant, and we're, we're rewarded for all the things that we've done here. So this is the process in which we're in, and we're in sanctification, and God is trying to make us, and so we learn from our mistakes. The Christian life is a life set aside for God's purpose. He wants to change our life to the very and the very core of who we are to reflect Jesus and use us for his purpose. This is sanctification of the Christian life. God is concerned not only with the believer's status, but he's also concerned with his condition, his state. He wants you not only just to be saved, but he wants you to be productive in this world as you are saved. Paul describes the process of sanctification or it like growing in Christ. He describes it like a marathon. Now look at what he says in chapter 3 here, verse 13. Let's go back and look at this one for just a minute. Look at what he says. 
He's treated like a marathon. And he says in 3.13, he says, look, I'm not regarding myself as having made it. In other words, what he says here, he says, I haven't arrived yet. I have, I, I'm still in the sanctification process. I'm not perfect. Now, we think about Paul in days today's time, 2,000 years later, we think about Paul as a writer in uh, two-thirds of the New Testament. We think about Paul writing all these letters and Paul being shipwrecked and beaten and the great works Paul did for Christ and in chains and he kept preaching and teaching. Well, almost to the point as Paul being a super Christian. Paul didn't look at himself that way. Paul looked at himself as like you and I would look at ourselves. We're just in process. We're imperfect people in process. And he said, look, I don't regard myself as having been made perfect or having gotten it all right. He said, I don't. He said, but here's the thing I am learning to do. Now, before I read this, and I know you've already looked at it, but before we go through this, I want you to understand what he's talking about. Before the Apostle Paul became Paul, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee. Saul of Tarsus was a bad man. Matter of fact, Saul, you've heard of the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts. Saul of Tarsus he gave approval for the stoning of Stephen. It was Saul of Tarsus' job. It was his life's mission. It was his religious zeal to persecute and kill Christians. That's what he was doing uh, before he became the Apostle Paul. On the road, you remember the story on the road to Damascus? The light shined in his eyes. It blinded him. God spoke to him. Why are you persecuting me? Paul get, uh, Saul of Tarsus gets saved, he gets his sight restored, and now he and then he goes on the missionary journeys. His identity is changed from Saul to the Apostle Paul, and, and so now we know him as a super Christian. But before he got born again, he had a terrible past. He was killing people like you and I. And he says that I have learned this one thing. I haven't got perfected yet, but I've learned one thing. Forget what lies behind. Now, for that dude, that was a heavy burden, what lied behind him. Can you imagine when he come to the truth of knowing who Jesus Christ was and the purpose of, of Christianity, the fact that Jesus wants all to be saved and all he's wanting for people to have a life in abundance to the full till it overflows, John 10, 10. That's what God wants for his people. And Paul was killing those type of people, spreading that message. Can you imagine the amount of guilt that the apostle Paul had to deal with the rest of his life? And he said, I'm learning to forget what was yesterday. I'm learning to forget what was behind me. Now, this is the task for a lot of us in the room because before we can ever move ahead, you got to forget what was behind you. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you messed up. Maybe you, maybe you messed up multiple times and you've done wrong. And now you've come to a realization of who Jesus is and you know, you're wanting to move forward, but you keep thinking about all the mistakes you made in the past, all the things that you've done wrong, all the times that you fell short of his glory. Paul says, if you're going to make it and you're going to move forward, you've got to learn to forget what lies behind you. Forgetting what lies behind me. And then you've got to take the second step and go forward in the verse here. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching or pressing forward to what lies ahead. What Paul's saying here, he says, look, if I spent all my time back in the past and the things I used to do, the things I did before I got saved, if I spent all my time back there, I will never move forward in my Christian walk. I will never be who God's called me to be. And some of y'all in this room today are still back here because of a mistake you made, because something you messed up, a marriage that went bad, a job that fell apart, a, a relationship that didn't work out, a mistake that you made that God's forgiven you of, but you just can't move beyond it because you still are focusing on that. Every time you say, you know what, I'm going to bury this and move ahead, it just keeps coming forward to you. It just keeps being brought up. Again, that's from the devil. Condemnation from the devil to keep you from being who God's called you to be. Paul says, I forget what's behind me, and I'm pressing. Now, this takes a lot of effort to press. He said, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is pushing. He's trying to be uh, the person that God's called him to be. You need to understand that sanctification is not a sprint nor a dash. 
You know, it's going to sprint, sprint and dash, right? You can do it for a short burst of time, but you're not going to do it long. You can run as hard, you can run as hard as you want to. I could run as hard as I can to that back door, but I promise you when I get to that back door, I'm going to fall over. <laughs> Used to be a time in my life, I could probably run down the road and go f- maybe to Cuddy's house and, before I collapse. But now, I could go to the back door and that'd be about the end of it. Matter of fact, y'all watch me, I can sit and walk from the back of the front, sit in the chair and work out sweating. That's why I turned the air down and the, and the, uh, air, the air conditioning down and the fan on. Now, you might be cold, but i got to be comfortable if I'm going to do this. So you being cold doesn't bother me. I'm okay with you being cold as long as I'm comfortable. That's all that really matters. So moving forward, pressing ahead, you need to wear a jacket, a coat, whatever you need to wear because the preacher's going to be comfortable if he's going to do his job. Now, I'm still sweating. Y'all are probably freezing. I'm sweating up here. But listen, we, we, it's not a dash. It's not a sprint. It's a long haul marathon. Paul describes it as a long marathon and it'll have twists and it'll have turns. It is, write this down somewhere if you don't mind. The sanctification process is about endurance, not speed. Remember what the Bible says, those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This is not about, you know, who's going to get there first. It's not about anything. It's about just enduring. Keep running. You have a setback. Get back up and run. You have you fall down. Get back up and run. You have you make a mistake on Saturday night. Get back up and run. You say a bad word on the way to work because somebody run you off in traffic. Get back on the thing and run. Your coworker ticks you off and you lost your cool and you got mad. Get back on this the track and run. It's endurance. You're going to have twists. You're going to have turns. You're going to have falls. You're going to have slips. You're going to have all these things. But what we're trying to do is endure, so that through. Uh, through our endurance, God is working out all this on us. The Holy Spirit guides us and He changes us. But we must be willing to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Sometimes the Holy Spirit needs to confront us as believers in order to change us. Anybody ever watched the show with Gordon Ramsay, the cooking show where I don't know exactly what. There's one called Hell's Kitchen, and there's another called Kitchen Nightmares. And what's the great thing about Gordon? The thing about Gordon Ramsay, he's always telling people how terrible they are. Your food's terrible. It's pitiful. You know, what's the purpose of that? In these series, Gordon Ramsay confronts business owners who are struggling. Most of the time, he's got to reveal that they are the problem, and they need to change. For many people, such a confrontation is difficult to come to grips with, but they need to grieve over how bad their situation is. Only in confronting this truth can someone take a a positive, can some positive take take place. Confronting failure leads to growth and sanctification. Remember that. Confronting failure leads to growth. And sanctification. Have you messed up in the last seven days? I want you to think about that. Or is your hand up saying nothing out loud? But I want you to think about it. I can tell you that I have in the last seven days. Lost my cool, done stupid stuff, with a, you know, all that, you know. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. Have you? Probably. Probably. So what do we do? We can wither back in our, our shell and we can say, you know what? I'm just always going to be this way. Just never going to get ahead. You remember Eeyore? Oh, mercy. Oh, it is me. Or we can say, you know what? I'm the problem. The biggest problem that you're going to face, and I'm done, but I want you to hear me. The biggest problem that you're going to face that you're going to have to overcome is the person in the mirror that you shave with. Unless you're a woman. <laughs> and it's the person in the mirror that you put makeup on. I hope you're not shaving if you're a woman. Or if you've got a, a, a face full of hair as a woman, you probably ought to shave. <laughs> the biggest problem we're going to have is us. Is us. And when we look at ourselves and we come to the fact that, you know what, I need to change. That's when change comes. 
But you got to be honest with yourself and say, you know what, I, I need to change. This is not who I want to be. This is not what I want to be. This is not what I want to do. This is not who I want to be. I want to be what Jesus calls me to be. I want to be who God asked me to be. I want to seek first the kingdom, not what the rest of the world is doing. There was a time in my life when God called me to preach as a teenager that, that I didn't I, I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want, you know, who wants to be a teenager and be called a preacher? I want to fit in like everybody else. And so I've done a lot of stupid stuff with the call of God on my life. But I finally got to the place where I realized it doesn't matter what, what my buddies or my peers thought about me. Well, these days, you learn this when you graduate high school, right? That all the people that were your friends in high school, you grow up and you move on, and half those people you'll never see again in your life. You might see a few of them you go back to reunions, and all the ones who said they were going to get somewhere and do something, they end up not doing anything, and by the time you see them again, they're 300 pounds, and they're living in a, in a you know, back in the woods in a trailer somewhere. They were going to do all kinds of things and told you that you were nobody, but they never did accomplish anything. And I realized in my life that, you know what, I'm not trying to impress anybody that I knew or that knew me, because at the end of the day, all of us, listen, and this is it, all of us are going to stand before God at the end of the day and give an account for ourselves. I'm not going to give an account for Don. I'm not going to give an account for Tom. I'm not going to give an account for Cuddy. I'm going to give an account for Kevin. And I'm not going to say, hey, well, God, you know what? Come on. I, I'm not as bad as Jason. I mean, I, after all, I got hair. You got to love me more because I'm not him. And God's going to say, what's he got to do with it? I'll deal with him when he gets here. He ain't got nothing to do with what you're dealing with. This is between me and you. Until we grasp that, we're never going to change. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you can blame everybody down here for the side of the tracks you came on. You can blame the people in your life. You can blame all kinds of things. But when you stand before him, you'll not do any of that. It'll be you and him alone. And here's what you had to work with. Why didn't you do it? So let me ask you a question. What are you going to do with the mistakes you made over the last seven days? Are you going to learn from them and grow and press forward? Are you going to keep holding on to what's behind and let it ball you up from making the future that God's got for you? At the end of the day, it's your decision. I can give you the truth, but it's not until you apply the truth that it sets you free. Truth is truth, but it's not until you apply it does it change it up. I pray that you apply it today. Let's stand on our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed across the room this morning. Father, speak to our hearts today. All of us in this room have fallen short of your glory. Whether we've done it this week, this month, this year, maybe we've not done anything really bad, but we're not home yet. So there's always things to be better at. There's always things to grow on. There's always things to, to get corrected in our lives. Father, make it clear to us today, those things. Speak to our hearts clearly this morning. But Father, more than anything, let us not blame the left, the right, the front, or the back. Let us look honestly within our heart and make the decision within us. That starting this day and this moment moving forward, we want to be everything that you've called us to be. And so we'll move forward trusting you. And so, Father, we commit this time. Speak to our hearts. Give us the courage to make the decisions that we need to make, to rededicate our lives, to join the church, to be saved. Whatever it is this morning, speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen.